Thank you, Indy. All right. So today's live show, a little bit late. I apologize. Not surprising here for, unfortunately, me uh, when it happens. But uh, the goal for today that I wanted to do was, uh, number one, as always, uh, thank everybody uh, for an amazing two years of the channel. Uh, I, I, I'm really at a loss sometimes to uh, uh, really understand the success of the channel, but it's been a great uh, two years. And one of the things that I wanted to do is uh, address some questions that people had. Uh, we I've seen a lot of questions. And so I asked my, uh, uh, I asked you all to hop on here and some questions off. And I do have some questions, which I'm going to uh, get to here in a second, uh, but I had some earlier questions that came out. And again, uh, I think uh, I want to address those. Uh, so uh, what I thought I'd do is just spend uh, an hour or so with you. We'll do a little bit more because I got in here late and apologies again for me being a little bit late. But we'll go ahead and uh, run through the questions uh, that I had received from a batch of you. So I asked my uh, Patreon uh, subscribers to go ahead and uh, send me some uh, questions to kind of start off. And I want to go ahead and kick off with them. So first on Q&A for today, uh, Lloyd Enochs, uh, who has been uh, a, a uh, subscriber and with me for quite a long time. Lloyd, Lloyd's been with me. Uh, a long time. Uh, what do you think it would take to create a unified national commercial port authority in the U.S. as exists in other countries? And what odds do you give on some form of national action plan being adopted? So I think, number one, the, the chances are thin, uh, largely because states and municipalities like having control over their ports. Uh, what they like even more is having federal money back them up. Uh, so I think the idea of getting national port uh, national ports is not really in the making. Now, that's existing ports that are there today. I think one of the things you're seeing around the world happening is the development of, of ports, uh, new port, and that has national. So, for example, if you want to create a West Coast port, uh, you know, other than L.A., uh, Long Beach or one of the other ones, then maybe uh, that would be an element there where you create a national port, but it'll be located in the state and there'll be some agreement with them. Or if a state or city wants to get rid of the port, the problem with ports is number one is, is they generate a lot of money for the communities and the land is worth a lot of money too. And so I think that's an issue. But the fact that the federal government funds part of ports gives them some control over it. I thought one of the big issues during the supply chain crisis was the fact that the Maritime Administration, which has a national overview of ports, uh, they're the ones that do the federal grants for the ports. And in time of war, national emergency can nationalize ports, was very quiet. And that was an opportunity there to really develop a much more robust national port strategy. So Odds of it very thin, unfortunately, uh, and and uh, and I say unfortunately for for very good reason. I think you need a national strategy, and I think we could still develop a national strategy even if the ports remain in the hands of local uh, and municipal authorities. I think we could still adopt a national strategy. I think one of the big problems you saw during supply chain is there was no national strategy. I mean, there was none whatsoever. Uh, I spent a lot of time <laughs> bashing on the fact that LA and Long Beach were really driving national strategy. And I think that was a big problem. So Lloyd, thank you for the question. Uh, Chris Vandekar, Chris, another one uh, of my uh, Patreon followers and, and subscriber, perhaps offering extra credit to your students if they host a small segment, probably on maritime history. And no, I'm not one of your students. Uh, so as you know, uh, I develop a lot of projects, and unfortunately, this is a one-person show, and some of them fall by the wayside a little bit. One of them has fallen by the wayside, but it's coming back, I promise you that, is finishing up the Maritime History one. We did five weeks or so of it. There's 10 more coming, and so I'm going to be uh, having that over to you, but I love that idea, Chris, actually, because in the next two weeks, actually, I have students, they actually came into my office and, and selected books off my shelf that um, I do review of maritime and naval books for an organization called the North American Society for Oceanic History. 
And as such, I get a ton of books. I have to go through, I got like 40, 50 books for this year. And I've been doing it for a few years now. So I literally have a bookshelf full of maritime books on every aspect you could possibly imagine. And so over the next uh, two weeks, they're doing presentations, 10 minute presentations. I think it's a great idea, Chris. I may ask them for extra credit if they would put that together into a video format and then I could post it uh, via my channel. I think that would be a great element uh, for them. So I really appreciate you coming up with that. Actually, it's, I, I think the students will appreciate it too, because there'll be some extra credit for you, for them. Uh, Rich Gosselin, another one of my uh, Patreons, you should create and promote with others of similar understanding a revised Jones Act. We've heard you speak out on needing such an animal, but given your professions and knowledge, you'd be great author of legislation needed for good national maritime laws. The best way for Sal to better the world. I, I don't know if Sal bettering the world is a good idea, but uh, I, I I love the idea, and I, I would add a, a couple of things. So yes, you've heard me go on about the Jones Act, and again, I am all for reform. I listen. I I, I believe more than anybody else that we need to update laws and make ourselves more competitive. And operating under a system that hasn't changed much is a problem. Uh, where I have problems with what comes out and when you usually see my uh, Better Call Sal videos is when people come out and either they're wrong or they're just misinterpret what issues are going on. Uh, I have been actually behind the scenes talking to a lot of groups about this. And one of the things that I've been hopping on is the creation of a very similar idea to this. One of my, uh, you know, I, I, I come up with a lot of ideas in case you hadn't figured it out yet. My problem is resources and time, but it, it shouldn't be me being the one who's calling out everything on this. Uh, I would love to see some entities come together. So for example, I've talked to the new superintendent at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy about maybe let's let's convene a panel together and put together some people, both academia, shippers, carriers, you name it, the whole group, uh, local uh, chamber of commerce type people uh, and, and big, big uh, uh, charters of ships. Let's get together and figure out what would work for the United States going forward in the future. And because if you look at the way things are going now, uh, what you're seeing is shipbuilding is being concentrated in East Asia, 94% of all the world ships, East Asia, Japan. China, Japan, Korea. Uh, Japan's losing out on that. It's going to be more China, Korea. Uh, and it's probably not a great idea to have all the world shipbuilding within a thousand miles of each other in two countries that don't really like each other. And I, I, I think it's really important. Plus, if we're going to be a naval nation, if we're going to build ships for the U.S. Navy, it really helps to have commercial shipping. I'm really amazed by the Navy just coming out and realizing now it's like, hey, you know, <laughs> commercial shipping actually helps us build and repair Navy ships. Uh, and uh, I'm always amazed by the, uh, by, by the uh, surprise I see when that happened. So I, I think a uh, policy like that would be great. Uh, my big issue with it, and, and again, that, that's me, issue is time. I just, I'm really hard pressed for time at, at this. Uh, being a full-time teacher, putting this channel together, uh, you know, having a son growing up and everything else I do. Uh, it, it, it's it unfortunately, uh, you unfortunately see that the fact that this is a one person show. Uh, but I think what I'd love to see is some resources come together. Uh, I would love to see a think tank counter the groups like Cato, for example. And it's not a pro US, but let's talk about policy. Let's talk about this. So one of my uh, things I want to do, I can't remember where I have the book at, but there is a, a book that was written entitled The Abandoned Ocean, which is a history of U.S. maritime policy uh, from the birth of the country to 1999, is I want to write an article that's the last chapter of that, or the most recent chapter of that book. You know, what's going on in the past 24 years since then? Because no one's done that. And I think we need to set up what's going on with our policy, what has changed. Uh, and I think that will help us develop a new way to reform it. And I think in my own way, I've talked about this. You know, I've talked about LNGs and, and, and liquefied natural gas carriers and bringing them in. And I, I, I think, unfortunately, those who oppose the Jones Act, those who want to open up U.S. coastal waters for foreign shipping uh, are well paid. They're well financed. Uh, I mean, there's a guy that works at Cato whose only job for five years has been to basically 
oppose the Jones Act. Uh, it's a good job. I mean, he hasn't done anything. Jones Act hasn't changed. He's still getting paid. I'd love to have that job. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't really manifest itself. And on the other side, the U.S. maritime industry is terrified of ever coming out and saying something publicly. And that's true of all maritime industries. I shouldn't just say the U.S. But yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. I, I'd love to be able to do that, Rich. All right. Kyle wrote this. If the U.S. continues current policies for the next 20 years, uh, what issues do you foresee Americans facing with regards to products and supply chains? So Kyle Smith wrote that. And Kyle, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think the question that's even a little bit more is what have we learned from what happened <laughs> over the past 20 years? Uh, what did we learn? What did we learn just from the past two years? What did we learn from the supply chain crisis? And what are we doing to implementing that? Uh, to me, We've seen some reform. So, for example, the Federal Maritime Commission, which is the federal entity that oversees international shipping for the United States, has gotten more power through the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. The five FMC commissioners have really been empowered with a little bit more uh, oomph to be able to oversee what goes on with international shipping. Understand, from the 1980s forward, we deregulated like crazy. I mean, we just opened it up uh, all the way. And so one of the things that we're trying to do now is get a handle on that. Now, understand, we benefited greatly from deregulation. We got ocean shipping that was ridiculous, ridiculously cheap. But at the same time, what you saw was what happened in the 90s and the 2000s with U.S. jobs flocking overseas, uh, shutdown of industry in the United States. And we really globalized to a point where we are utterly, utterly interdependent upon other nations. And so I, I think we need to take a look at what happened in the supply chain crisis. What we found out very quickly is, is that our supply chain is geared to a certain level. And when it goes beyond that certain level, up or down a few percentage points, it's chaos. It, it's just, it's not geared for that. But again, how many industries are not geared for that? How many industries tomorrow can go 10% either way? And but the problem with the supply chain supply chain industry is, is that almost everything else depends on the supply chain. And if the supply chain cannot absorb a hit, that's a problem. And we've seen this. We saw demonstrations. I have a video I did. Oh, it was about a year and a half ago uh, on a report that the Federal Maritime Commission, I was, I was scrolling through the Federal Maritime Commission website. I mean, who doesn't do that on for, for just, you know, for fun? Uh, and, and I'm scrolling through and they had these publications and I'm scrolling through it. And I found this report from 2015 and I read it. And I was like, holy crap. It's like everything that went wrong in the uh, uh, supply chain crisis was in that report. It was amazing. I, I read every page of that thing. And every time I turned the page, it's like, no. And then you read the next page, like, oh, it's like, holy cow. And so they knew it back in 2015. The problem is the FMC had no power to do anything about it. And unfortunately, it didn't get to the attention level it needed in either the administration or businesses. But now someone at the FMC should be dusting off that report and sitting there saying, okay, here are the lessons we learned. What do we need to do about it? You know, I, I think one of the big things we need to look at, I got this, I got asked this question the other day by a researcher. And they said, well, Sal, if you would change things, you know, how we do, you know, things in the government, how would you, how would you change things? And I, I would, I've always said this is you need to create within a, a, a department, whether it's secretary of transportation or commerce or interior, something like that, but probably transportation is you need to make the four horsemen of the Buddha judge. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's Buddha judge or anybody else who's secretary there, but the four horsemen would be the four heads of the four transportation sectors, road, rail, air, and maritime. And they should be equal and they should have the same powers. Uh, what you see right now, for example, we just saw the the, the uh, nominee for the FAA withdraw his his uh, uh, nomination. Uh, that's because the head of the FAA has always historically been a pilot with massive aviation experience. The person they nominated here was a military guy who has been working in transportation, but his only aviation has been he's been the CEO of Denver Airport for a year. That's not going to get you to be the head of the FAA. But, and again, you, you get into this element here with, um, with thing and, and Blair's right about the uh, pipelines too. That's another element, uh, it's element look at, but I think transportation, if, if you can create that, because one of the things we found out in the supply chain crisis, again, is that we didn't have a shortage of ships. We had plenty of ships. Just go look up LA and Long Beach. There were plenty of ships. There was no shortage of ships. 
the issue became getting the cargo ashore and should have everything have come into LA and Long Beach. Uh, and, and, uh, so one of the things we've been seeing consistently here is the, the need to kind of relook at our strategy of import exports in and out of the United States, both by ships into seaports and in by air airports, uh, and to look at how we move things around. You know, I've, I've really become over the past year, really looking really hard at class one railways in the United States. And I've learned a lot about railways in the, in the United States, not a sector that I've done a lot of. But it is so essential to understand how ports operate if you don't understand railways, because three quarters of all that cargo that went into L.A. and Long Beach was going by rail. And when that cargo doesn't move by rail, then all of a sudden you see what happens. And with precision scheduling, with uh, uh, the cut down in the number of personnel on railways going from a half mile train to a two mile train, uh, our tracks aren't designed for that. We don't have siding so that trains can pass each other that are two miles long. It just, they don't exist. And we're not investing at all in that infrastructure. And again, I think we need to look at infrastructure. If you go back to the United States, the first Congress, a quarter of all the laws passed by the first Congress were maritime related. They were all maritime related. Uh, and one of them was the first public infrastructure program in the history of the United States, lighthouses. Uh, lighthouses were essential. Lighthouses, there had been about a dozen lighthouses built in the U.S. prior to the American Revolution. And the uh, infrastructure bill took over the lighthouses by the federal government and then built new ones, uh, all because it was necessary to see that construction go in. All right, uh, I'm going to go to questions here on our stream. So I'm going to go back to the very beginning here, so I apologize. Uh, but I want to go in and see uh, what questions we have. So there was an early question there by John Conrad. Uh, my buddy over at G-Captain, asked about an article Steve Carmel wrote over at SIMSEC, the Center for International Maritime Security. And the, the SIMSEC article was a, a really interesting one. Uh, what he asked was, uh, do we think we're facing, did, did what Steve write and what Steve wrote about, he's a, a VP over at Maersk Lines, uh, the Maersk Lines in the United States. And he asked, uh, did what Steve did Steve adequately assess our issue with tankers in the United States? And I think that's a really interesting question. We have not built a new commercial tanker since the 2010s. And one of the things you're going to see is American tankers start getting old and they're going to have to be scrapped. Do we have replacements for them? Under the Jones Act, for example, you have to be an American tanker to take oil out of Alaska, bring it down to the United States. What happens if those big crude carriers go out of service because they're too old. Uh, do that, what does that mean we either waive the Jones Act or does we open up do we open up Alaska just for foreign export of oil? Uh, those are big questions and I think we need to start addressing them. Understand the military made a fundamental mistake. I mean mistake. At the end of the Cold War, they adopted the end of history strategy. They they figured, okay, we're not going to face another peer to peer you know, major power thing. You got to remember, U.S. Navy has faced off in the 20th century against multiple navies. It was the Germans in World War One. It was the Japanese and the Germans in World War Two. It was the Soviets in the Cold War. And then 1990s roll around. It's like mm, no one's left. You know, remember, Chinese Navy was nothing. The Russian Navy was was falling apart. Uh, and so uh, we really neglected that. And one of the things they did was privatize out part of the U.S. Navy. One out of five ships in the U.S. Navy are manned and crewed by civilian uh, merchant mariners. And they got rid of a lot of commercial contracts, a lot of commercial ships that backed up the Navy. And the Navy was a huge proponent for commercial shipping up until World War II, and then it changed. And now they're just realizing they've made that mistake. All right, let's look at some questions here on the stream because I promised that for you. So let's see. Uh, Espen Silver, uh, Silver, Silverstein, uh, Silverstein, you guys are, I, my, can I be clear on my pronunciations? Did two videos on the petrol rolling in the dry dock in Scotland. I've gotten more comments from the Scots in how to say Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh. I, I have no idea anymore. I, I, I thought I could pronounce Edinburgh, but obviously I can't because there's no pleasing the Scots when it comes to the pronunciation. And that's fine. Uh, pronunciations are my, my, my fault. It's always, and I should take the time to learn how to pronounce it correctly. So I'm fine with that. All right. 
Espen, as a recent newcomer to shipping, what are the must-read news sources to complement your excellent channel and stay up to date in the industry? I, I know some of you, Blair, uh, threw out there uh, some some great ones here. So uh, I agree. Uh, G Captain, Splash 24-7, Freight Wave, Sea Intelligence, all great ones. One of the things I do for, with uh, the, those of you that support me, and again, I, I appreciate all the support I get. I really do. I'm, I, I'm terrible at telling you that and showing you that, and I apologize for that. But a lot of things I use, the uh, Patreon members, a subscription, the super thanks you all give me is to uh, get subscriptions to sites that are really expensive. I mean, all those are great, but you know, things like Tradewinds and Journal of Commerce and Lloyd's, man, the subscriptions to those are ridiculous. Ridiculous. And I've talked to them about that, by the way, too, because they're geared to pay subscriptions of, you know, the subscriptions are coming from basically the big shipping firms. And, you know, they use that money to put together some great reporting that they're fantastic, but it makes it for someone who's just kind of interested in it it's almost impossible to see anything. And I've talked to them about, you know, you should put some stuff out beyond the paywall at times or open it up after a set period of time. But all of those are great sources. I, I agree entirely. I had a few more in there. Uh, I look at things like oil price uh, for the oil sector. I think that's a really good one. Cruise industry news. I look at that. Uh, I look at uh, container news. I look at Lodestar. Uh, I look at uh, 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 sea trade. Uh, th there's a few of them out there. I think those, but are my favorite right there that Blair hit right off the bat. I, I think they're really good with that. Uh, G Captain does the maritime splash 24 seven, the maritime excellently. Uh, splash is really quick. Lots of stories more on the international aspect than anything else. Freight waves covers all the aspects of transportation. I think they're really uh, good with that. Uh, go ahead and hit another one here from Blair. I'm wondering if Sal has the same view as me on this and bear in mind, I'm not an American, but here, here, but if Cato got their way and the Jones Act scrapped, I personally think we would see a demise goes on here of us builders and crew with a wave of firings out flaggings too. I, I Blair, I think you're exactly right. I, I think one of the things that is not been done here is to talk about the impact that it has. And if you want to see the impact, you just have to look at great Britain post uh, Falklands war when the ships taken up from trade came back and those routes had been taken by foreign ships. Or even more recently, the P&O ferries takeover, where P&O ferries on one afternoon fired their entire UK uh, employment base and replaced them. Uh, the UK just passed a law, I posted uh, this the other day, and it'll be in this What the Ship coming up, uh, where I talk about the fact that the UK just passed a law saying that if you're going to work in the coastal waters of the UK, you have to at least pay UK minimum wage, which is good. But at the same time, it means that there's no way those jobs are ever coming back to Brits because no Brit can afford to work at the minimum wage uh, salary. That's great if you're a Filipino. It's great if you're an Indian, if Indonesian or Chinese or Russian uh, getting that job. But for a Brit, a Scot, Welsh, Irish, uh, it's not going to do much for you, unfortunately. And that's the danger here. And, and and again, one of the things I keep saying is these guys who talk about let's repeal the Jones Act, they, they keep predicting Rainbows and unicorns will happen, but now all of a sudden, and yes, while there is foreign ships that come in and out of our ports, as soon as those foreign ships come in our port, they're leaving very quickly. Uh, but if they stay in our ports, if they operate on a coastwise route, and there's a lot of problems with that, let's be clear. It, it, it's again, I keep getting in this argument, let's open up short sea shipping. Well, until you could make it cheaper to move a container from Savannah to Boston by ship, it, it's not going to happen. And because it's going to take more time and it's actually going to cost you more. And it's just not going to happen because it's too easy to throw it on the back of a, of a semi and roll it down I-95 and pay $2 a mile. Uh, until you can get cheaper than that, you're not going to do it. Uh, and the problem you're going to have is you're going to have people earning a minimum wage of $22 a day competing against Americans who are making $7.00. 50, 75 cents up here with the new minimum wages. Uh, but even if that minimum wage goes up, I, I mean, how are you going to compete uh, against that? It is just going to hammer. What happens when the when the Staten Island ferry is reflagged in Panama and, and crewed by Filipinos? Uh, what happens when the ferries uh, along the uh, uh, Washington Puget Sound area or San Francisco Bay or towboats up and down the Mississippi? 
operate in that way. And understand, they will figure out ways to do this. There's no doubt. They'll put birthing barges off of New Orleans and have the crews sleep on them so they don't even ever have to come ashore in the United States. Uh, so they will come up uh, with ways to do that. All right, uh, let's go ahead, uh, move on down here. There's a string of bad jokes here uh, by uh, uh, by uh, Indy Lovelace, which I am going to just fast pass there uh, so that I can get to some questions here from everybody. So I apologize. Uh, let's see. A lot of great comments and, and thank yous. I appreciate all that. Let's see what we need here. I'm just, I'm just scrolling down here. Talking about things. A lot of generator talk about being offline. I was mentioning the reason for starting late here is we had a, uh, uh, a hailstorm come, come through here. So we had a uh, uh, power blink here. So this is from JS. Are LA and Long Beach ports getting a big volume of import containers yet? Did the union ports get the new contracts done? So LA and Long Beach are still getting huge amounts. They're big ports. I mean, they're never not going to be big ports. Uh, I talk about the fact that how things are moving to the east and Gulf Coast, but LA and Long Beach still get a consistent number of ports. They're not going anywhere. Uh, LA was the biggest port last year in terms of number of containers, uh, so just narrowly over the port of New York, New Jersey. However, one of the problems is we're seeing that shift. Now that shift had been going on since 2017, since the new lane of the Panama Canal opened, and you can now have what's called Neo Panamax, uh, ships that exceed the old locks for a long time. Those old locks built in 1914 is what constrains ships a thousand feet long, you know, a uh, uh, hundred and uh, five feet wide with a 35 foot draft. That was it. Ships were built to that. And I, I was on a ship that met the, the, the uh, uh, specifications of the lock and man, there was like a narrow margin to get in and out of the locks. I'm talking inches on each side, uh, but you fit within the locks. The new lane that was designed in the early two thousands didn't actually foresee ships building this big. But now you can now bring ships through that are no longer four or 5,000 TEU ships, but 15,000 TEU ships. And so what you see is people are bypassing the West Coast and going through the Panama Canal and then up to the Eastern Gulf Coast. Or one of the things Panama has done is put a container terminal in a Panama, offload on the Pacific side, just rail or, or truck the containers to the East Coast side, and now hop feeder services out of there. So LA and Long Beach is losing out. They are. They're, they're losing out. Matter of fact, we just saw some agreements go in place where some ships are going to be shifting over between terminals. Uh, they do not have a new union agreement in place. Understand that union agreement has been hanging in the wind since 2015. The last time they had a slowdown, they punted it down the road. And then all of a sudden they wanted to sit there and say, no, you know, what, what we're going to do here is, is, is basically, uh, put it out. And then the renegotiation came in during the height of the supply chain. Obviously, the union won an agreement during the supply chain crisis. That was the time for them to get it. When labor was in short supply, they were in the driver's seat. However, who they're negotiating with is really important. They negotiate with an outfit called the Pacific Maritime Association. And the Pacific Maritime Association basically is, is, a, is a consortium of the terminals, the ocean carriers, uh, and the ports themselves. So remember, you're dealing with the ocean carriers in this, the big container companies. And these are almost all owned overseas. And they're the ones who are in this negotiation with the unions. And understand maritime unions have a long history with the United States maritime industry. They do. Go back to the turn of the 20th century and U.S. mariners were treated like crap. I mean, just pure. I mean, there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a court case, 1896, called the Arago decision, where the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that merchant mariners did not have the mental capacity to basically determine what's good for them and put them in the same level as wards of the states and Native Americans. Because what they, the argument was that mariners signed a, a shipping agreement to sail on a vessel, some mariners jumped ship because the captain was absolutely abominable. Uh, and so they jumped ship. And then the master had uh, justice of the pieces and marshals arrest the guys and bring them back to the ship. And the court ruled that you can sign away your 13th Amendment rights. You know, it, they rule out involuntary servitude, but not servitude, not, not voluntary servitude. And when you sign a shipping article, they said, well, that's voluntary servitude. And this led to a huge unionization movement on the West Coast. It culminated in 1934 in the West Coast labor strikes that were absolutely out of control. I mean, it was just 
it was horrific. Uh, th that's still a day off for all longshoremen, uh, longshore workers on the West Coast to this day, the day of the strike. And so it, it is a it is a problem right now. The issue there was a report just the other day that uh, they were they were arguing over lunch times. That was the PMA leaking that out. Uh, they're trying to leak that out. The issue here is really to get the agreement about automation, about how to phase out existing workers, how to bring in new workers, and how to ensure that there's enough money coming into union jobs to pay for the retirees. And, and this is the problem you have. And like every other industry, there's there's new forms coming in. And so you've got to be able to address that. And I, I think that issue is a really important one to look at. Uh, all right, let's go over here to another one that just came in here. So I had this one come in from Global Source. Sal, my entire pandemic shipping journey of almost 300 containers and break bulk uh, charters have been uh, narrated by you. <laughs> Question, will you finally get the U.S. to actually modernize ports in intermodal when what? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm with you entirely, Global Source. Uh, I, I would really love to sit there and say that this is going to happen, that we're going to be able to uh, modernize our ports. I, I think it's really a, a question for each of the individual ports. There has to be incentive for them to do it. And, and unfortunately, what happens is the ports compete against each other. They bid each other. So if you look at what's happening now, take that last question about LA Long Beach. The ports that are getting the benefit of this shift to the East Gulf Coast are Houston, Savannah, New York, New Jersey. Absolutely. Savannah is the big one because Savannah isn't isn't constrained by land like Houston and New York, New Jersey are. So they're going to grow immensely. Uh, they're also in Georgia, which means unions, not an issue so much down there. Uh, emissions issues, not so much an issue. Uh, but there are other ports that want to challenge Savannah, uh, Norfolk, for example, in, in the, the Virginia ports. Uh, Charleston tries to do it, but Charleston is constrained by its geography for a great deal. Jacksport in Florida. Florida really wants to make a move for this. They, they, they want to make a big move. Uh, you've got the new terminal coming in in New Orleans. So I, I think one of the things we're going to see is a – we're going to see a lot of issues here about uh, how, this, how this ports develop. And I think modernization is going to be a key thing. If you look at what the port of Baltimore is doing, for example, I think Baltimore is probably the best example here of a port that is modernizing and trying to keep up and try to do the most it can. So uh, one of the things I hope we're able to see here is uh, a, a ability for these ports to develop in a way that maybe is is not so much uh, as modern as I get to see but perhaps showing up here in a new way. All right, let's go ahead and jump down here to another question. Let's see here. Checking here, global source depends on what port. Sorry, I'm just reading through questions here. Oh, so there was a question here, and I think I, 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 I don't think I passed it. But uh, there was an interesting question here, and I'm not sure where it was. So I apologize, or else I throw it up here. But the question I saw, saw here, and there's a reference to it right here uh, from Dances with Fishes, Mexican shipbuilding is interesting. Yeah, I think the question about Mexican shipbuilding and will Mexico basically uh, develop as an alternative. So I think there's, there's several areas in Mexico to think about. So number one, ports, Mexican ports. Uh, we know about the development on the west coast of Mexico of ports. These are seen as potential eyeballs, excuse me, to uh, LA Long Beach and, and along that area. So I, I think that is uh, uh, an interesting one. The problem you have, of course, is you can land as many containers as you want in Mexico. You got to get them out of Mexico, which means rail. You have to have the rail service. Now, there was the big merger, the Kansas uh, City merger between Kansas City, uh, Mexico, and, uh, and, and Canada, which creates now the first north-south rail line that connects Canada, U.S., and Mexico. Will that rail line service get the money to go down to these ports, expand, and have routine, regular service? Uh, that will be interesting. Uh, will they be able to do that? Uh, as Rick asked as here, Rich asked here, Mexico has a shipbuilding industry. They don't. 
But there's a lot of question whether or not we see shipbuilding industries start up in some other countries. Will China create shipbuilding industries outside? Will corporations do it? Will they go to Mexico? Will they go to Jamaica? Will they go in the Bahamas to do this? Uh, one, of the, one of the problems with starting a shipbuilding industry outside of a country is the access to resources. Uh, China, for example, is really good at shipbuilding because they have all the resources right there. They, they, they produce steel, they produce a lot of the stuff there, but a lot of components still are not there. And so one of the things that, that you will see here is it, you may see some ship repair facilities open up. For example, the big ship repair facility in Bahamas that does a lot of the dry dockings for ships uh, is, is in place there. And you see them being used all the time. I think that is a uh, really interesting one. But again, I, I, I think I come back to this issue of, of can Mexico sustain it? Will it be cheaper, for example, to do it? And again, one of the things we're seeing on shipyards over the world is consolidation. There are less shipyards today than there were, you know, I think the stat I, I, I use a lot is from 2009 to today, you've seen a 40% decrease in the number of shipyards worldwide. All right, uh, let's go on here. Uh, going on here. I'm sorry. I'm jumping down to some questions here. All right, let's go to this one. Uh, ABC, what is, uh, why are shipping schedules in Europe so efficient compared to the USA? And I still see Buddha judge as grossly under, under equipped for anything supply chain related related. Okay. So a couple of things about, uh, Europe versus us. Okay. I would argue it depends where in the U S you're looking. So one of the things that you see about Europe is the creation of the megaports. I mean, you look at Rotterdam, you look at uh, Algeciras, uh, you look at the big ports, uh, Felixstowe, around there. They're really geared for the big, large ships to come in and rapidly move containers out of them. And I think you have a couple of methods to do that. A lot of them in Europe, for example, is short sea shipping. Short sea shipping is really well used in Europe versus the United States. And of course, I deal with this issue a lot. I see a lot of people argue about that. It's like, why does Europe do it so well and the U.S. doesn't? Number one, geography. I think geography is a lot different. I mean, almost every European nation has access to the ocean in one way or the other, even landlocked. You can, you can pretty much get to a lot of countries within the interior of, of Europe by the ocean. I mean, again, you have the Rhine uh, 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 Maine, I know I'm saying that wrong, uh, Mon, uh, Danube Canal that bisects Europe. I mean, cuts right across Europe. You can go from Rotterdam and come out in the Black Sea. Not you would want to come out in the Black Sea by Snake Island, but you can. Uh, U.S. doesn't quite have that. Yeah, we got the Mississippi that goes north to south, but we don't have anything that goes from New York to L.A. or San Francisco, for example. So the geography is a lot different. Uh, I would say the shipping schedules on the East Coast are a lot better. And this is a big issue here, and I'll give you it. Ships that go to the West Coast, go to L.A. and Long Beach, typically offload 80 to 100 percent of their cargo in L.A. and Long Beach. There's like no secondary stop. Sometimes they'll stop at Oakland or maybe up to the Seattle Tacoma area, but that's it. But they offload nearly their entire load into those ports. And any delays with that one ship causes just a cataclysm down the, the supply chain, down the down the, the ship's waiting. On the East Coast, Gulf Coast, container ships offload 20, 30 percent of their cargo. So they're in and out in a day, uh, maybe two tops, which makes schedules much more efficient. And I see that. Uh, regarding uh, Secretary Buttigieg, I think, again, you know, one of the things we tend to do is put people into the secretariat positions who are chosen for a lot of reasons and not always for the most qualifications. My, qu my issue with this is who does he pick in the sub positions below him? So, for example, the uh, administrator for the Maritime Administration is Ann Phillips, former one star admiral in the U.S. Navy. Fantastic lady, I, I, well qualified naval officer. I don't question that for a second, but she has no commercial maritime experience. And I think that's an issue. I think that's a severe issue that if you don't spend your time uh, in the field and have background on it, it's going to cause you some problems. And, you know, you're playing a learning game. He, she's going to have to rely on people below her to feed her information. And, and sometimes you need visionary leaders. And the question is, are you going to maintain the status quo or are you going to come in and try to change things? Thanks, ABC, for the question. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. I'm going to scroll down here a little bit more. And if for any reason I miss your question, I apologize. Just go ahead and repost it because, like I said, I'm scrolling down here. 
Go look down here. Here we go. Uh, one of my favorites, Frosty Flake. Uh, what's going on with shipping? Railroads need to expand infrastructure and pay for it because it's the cost of doing business. Do you agree? Apply supports. Yeah, I do. I think railroads, and again, I've been following a lot on railroads recently. And what's really been interesting, if you look at the finances of the big class one railways, they're doing pretty good uh, financially wise. They've been making some good money. Uh, the question is, have they been investing that money back in? The The issue they had with the strike was really amazing. I mean, the way they treated their workers was terrible. I understand most people don't like unions. I, I get that. I 100% get that. But sometimes businesses can take advantage of that. The idea that you can't schedule days off, that sick days, uh, that that's a bit of a problem. It's a bit of a problem. And the way they were scheduling was terrible. And I, I think you need to pay for that. Again, I you know I have a railway that cuts through. I've been a volunteer firefighter for 25 years. We got a railway, Norfolk Southern, that cuts through our district. And I'm not exactly sure how we handle an issue with that. There's not a lot of traffic on that, that spur line we're on. Uh, it goes down to Fort Bragg, but we know that what goes down to Fort Bragg isn't always the best stuff. So we're, we're concerned about that. And again, what are you doing to mitigate that? that you know, there's got to be some payment for that. And railways are, are just like any other common infrastructure. Everybody benefits from them. Even though you may, may never been on a railway in your life, guarantee you some goods or commodities that you use come on that railway. So I think we need to do that. And I think it applies to ports too. Uh, I think we need to have expenditure. However, I do think also that it shouldn't, the companies that are involved need to pay for it too. You can't be sitting there and recording huge profits and not be contributing back to this. This is the thing that the large container companies are getting hit with really hard right now because of the mega profits they made in 2021 and 2022. If you look at just 2021 in a single year, they made more profits than they did in the past decade. Now, you can sit there and say, wow, they're making a lot of money or man, they're lousy businessmen because they've been losing money for the past decade. And I think that's true, too. So what's the right formula here? What's the right method that we go about doing it? How much should they be paying to help? So when you got to raise the Bayonne Bridge in New Jersey because container liners are building new Neo Panamax vessels and they can't get under the old Bayonne Bridge, who pays for that? Is it the shipping companies? Is it New Jersey? Is it the Port Authority? And, and I, I know what the answer is. It's the Port Authority. I got it. And I've had people tell me this, that it's not the citizens, it's the Port Authority. But where's the Port Authority get its money from? Uh, they're going to raise bonds. They're going to uh, increase rates and fees. That's where that money comes from. And so the question is, how do you do this? And again, visibility. I am not a big proponent for government being in charge. I'm not because I've, I've worked for government. I know how inefficient they are. But what they should be efficient in doing is getting information out, is being able to get the information out, putting it out there and telling everybody what it is. Uh, and so uh, uh, I think that's the big issue about it. Uh, there's a little bit of an interesting discussion here going back and forth that I just caught here uh, on ports. Uh, ABC, I can't imagine Antwerp or Rotterdam not being constantly operating. We're talking about 24-7 operations, 24-7. If you remember, my first video I ever had that took off was a video I did on uh, when President Biden announced we were going 24-7 in LA and Long Beach. And the video, the, the, the title of the video was, you know, have no fear the government's here to help you or something like that. Uh, it, it, and, and I mockingly said, this is not going to work. And it wasn't because 24-7 in the port is great. But if it, you don't have 24-7 trucks and trains coming into the terminal, it's not going to work. They needed to go ahead and get the big shipping companies, the big carriers, along with the big consumers, agreeing to get their trucks there. You know, you had to get the Walmarts, the Targets, the Home Depots, the Ikeas. What's really interesting is you would think those big box stores take up a huge percentage of containers coming in. They don't. If you add them up, it's not a lot. If you take the top 20, it's maybe 20%. It's not a lot. It, it, we take in so much goods through the, the, the country. It's really hard. And the problem is you can offload the ships 24-7 all day, but it doesn't do you any good if you can't get it out of the yard. And that's where LA and Long Beach had a problem. The problem LA and Long Beach had was they started taking ships that just showed up. These, these, these carriers of opportunity, I call them. They basically would pull a ship out of service in the Middle East Africa, Asia, loaded up with boxes at $20,000 a pop and sail it across and literally arrive off the port of LA and look for a terminal to offload. That's not the way you do business. And that's the fault of the terminals there. But again, I don't think that got uh, really uh, dinged. 
Uh, Blair was asking, uh, until recently, I believe the Port of LA wasn't 24 7. They weren't. They, they were sometimes, and some terminals would go 24 7. But the problem was they didn't want to pay for that because it wasn't efficient either. Uh, they wanted to make their margins work. And, you know, one of the things that the criticisms I have for people like Gene Soroka at LA is he would always highlight the fact of how many, you know, uh, appointments went unanswered by truckers. Well, truckers weren't going to answer it because drayage carriers weren't going to come in because they weren't making money. Uh, they were lucky, you know, on normal days pre-COVID, you can be a drayage, a, a short haul truck driver, come in and maybe get two, three lifts out of a terminal and deliver the containers. During the highest supply chain, you're lucky to get one. And that's just not efficient or making money. Oh, and by the way, those truck drivers waiting in line have no food, no bathroom, uh, they're getting ticketed uh, for being parked along roads that they're not supposed to be in, all because they can't get in the terminal. So uh, I learned a lot about trucking, too. I really recommend Freight Waves for that. I learned more about trucking than uh, with them than anything else. Uh, all right. I keep looking here for some questions. Uh, if you can, if you address them to me, that's easy to find. Let's see right here. Here's one. Daniel Sun. Uh, we have the largest oil refinery in Europe, Folly. Uh, I think refinery issues are a really interesting one right now. I know there's a little bit of a chain of conversation going on here that I'm just picking up on. Uh, so one of the big flaws, I would argue, that we have not in invested in in the United States is refineries. Uh, I used a stat from EIA, the Energy Information Agent uh, Administration, in their This Week in Petroleum, which, again, I love to read. I don't know why. It's just, for me, it's one of those weird things. I I, I really like to find out what's going on with petroleum. Uh, and I would also recommend oilprice.com, another great site to follow if you want to see about the tanker industry. I think if you're not watching the tanker industry, you're, you haven't been listening to me because that is the industry that is what containers were a year or two ago. It's going to be these tanker industries. But refineries are really interesting because of the lack of refineries in the U.S. We just haven't built refineries. There's been a major, major oil refinery built since 1977. We've added on. We've improved. We built some smaller ones, but not a major one, which means that in the U.S., we pull oil out of the ground in such large quantities that we exceed our refinery capacity. And not just because of the amount, but because of the type of oil. We don't have enough refining uh, capacity for the type of oil we pull out of the ground. Therefore, we have to literally have oil tankers passing each other, carrying one type of oil out of the country and another type of oil into the country. Why were we importing Russian oil? Because Russian oil had the type of oil that our refineries love. All right, let's go to this one. Dreadnought, great, great name. Excellent, sir. Thumbs up on that one. With the U.S. pivot to Asia and the South China Sea, could we see a reopening of Navy bases in the Philippines? I believe there's an agreement to use the current bases, but is more on the table. Wow, I, I have to say that the shutdown of U.S. military bases in the Philippines at, at the beginning of the 1990s was a huge, huge mistake going on. I understand what was going on in the Philippines and the politics of the time, but losing Subic Bay, losing Clark Field, was a huge detriment to the United States. Now, I understand Philippines wanted us out, and that's what you did. Uh, but I think that issue there was 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 a, a big problem because it removed a U.S. footprint in the Western Pacific. Now, we still have it in Korea and Japan, but the uh, the base at Subic was absolutely essential. It's a huge repair facility. I remember when I was in the Persian Gulf, the first Persian Gulf War, and uh, we had ships that came from the U.S. East Coast and the U.S. West Coast. And I can remember seeing the ships come from the West Coast. And the ones that had been based out in the Philippines were immaculate. They were amazing. They did a lot of repair work in the Subic Bay area. Uh, they hired Filipinos and used them. And again, why are Filipinos the most common nationality of Mariner you see in the world? Uh, and largely, it was, it was derived from working with the U.S. and the U.S. Navy for a long time. Uh, I think the U.S. missed a vital moment in the 1930s when we didn't modify U.S. laws to allow Filipinos to sail on U.S. ships. Uh, I think we would have been absolutely a powerhouse of all times. This is how the British operated. They had Indians, Africans, uh, uh, Laskers, uh, you name it, operate on their ships. Uh, and uh, that's the way they operated at such a low cost because a lot of their crew weren't European, you know, English doing it. They, they, they created this, this entity that, that operated by it. But I do think that, um, it, you know, the, the question is the government in the Philippines, it changes so much. 
you talk about our politics going from left to right. Well, Philippine politics goes from left to right. One moment you love America, one moment you hate America. And that's America. We're just that way. We, we you know, we're very bipolar in our relations. And so uh, if, if they're in favor of it, it comes back in. You would have to negotiate a treaty on this to get some time before you invest back into it. But I, I think the U.S. really lost a moment. You see the U.S. investing a lot in Guam right now. But, man, Guam is a tiny, tiny little island the size of Chicago. Uh, so it's not big. All right, moving on here. Uh, Topia SR, what do you think of the pending Teamsters strike at UPS in August? Would the federal government step in like with the railroads last year? Well, I think the federal government will always be there. I think I think you're going to see Secretary of Labor. You'll see Secretary of Transportation. You'll see a lot of people behind the scenes playing a role. The question is, what happens if the Teamsters go on strike at UPS? And it's much like the railway. The railway was not going to be allowed to go on strike. The, the, the U.S. government was going to intervene. Uh, if the West Coast goes on strike, you can see the U.S. government intervene. Uh, you can't afford it. The amount of money this costs if this strike happens is a problem. But there has to be negotiations going on here. And lots of times what we see are these negotiations punted down the road. You have to listen to what the labor is talking about because, again, labor is getting squeezed out in certain areas all the time. I mean, again, it's, it's you know, how many toll booth operators are there in the world today? Not a lot. Easy Pass got rid of that. So, you know, you have to change with the economy. The question is, uh, when you're in a vital transportation distribution system like UPS, can you afford to see it happen? All right, uh, let's keep going here a little bit. We're coming up on our time. We'll go a little bit past the hour since I started late. Again, I, I apologize for the late start. Uh, I'm going to go on to some questions going back here among everybody. Try to find some good questions here. Glad everybody's having a good conversation with each other. Uh, Patrick Splane, I won't put yours up, but you got a very good uh, uh, question right there. Let's see right there. It's hard to fight. Try to find just a few more good questions here. Here we go. Go over here to AR. Have things slowed down this month on the import side? I'm a customs broker and Port Everglades was closed last Tuesday and Thursday due to lesser than expected traffic. So just saw a report that uh, uh, trade volumes are coming back up in some of the East Coast, Gulf Coast ports. So Charleston, Savannah, Houston, New York, New Jersey coming back in. Uh, so uh, definitely saw it again. February is always a slow month. Uh, coming in because of the Lunar New Year, because of holidays in China. And this one was really extended out because of issues. Uh, port Everglades is always an interesting port because of its traffic it gets from the Caribbean and South America and Central America. So that has a lot to do with it too. Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm not sure about it. Uh, port Everglades isn't such a big port that it, I always get a chance to see it. Uh, but but I do think that we're seeing imports ticking back up again. Uh, I, I always show that slide chart that comes out that shows you the monthly TEU uh, imports that come in. And what we saw is from January to February that fall. But I expect March to see that uptick. We've seen that uptick over the past five years. And you'll probably see that happen again here. Uh, moving on here. Get another one here. Manatee, what's your opinion on deglobalization, East against the West, in the national corporations? Uh, I think deglobalization is uh, an important thing. I think, you know, onshoring is the new word you're hearing a lot, bringing industry back. The problem you have is it's such a long-term commitment and cost until you get returns. Are there the funds? Are there the positive legislative efforts to onshore certain industries? You know, China is suffering right now from losing business. We know that. It's, it's very clear from the data. Uh, who's picking it up? Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, uh, and India. India is the big one. Everyone should be watching India right now. India is the big one. I've been watching reports out of India about new port developments, about port construction. They are getting ready to be importing, exporting big time. Uh, and India is working on developing that. Uh, I, I think... The East against West national corporations. Remember, you know, the East, China has, has, you know, China will label itself communist, but it is much more, in my opinion, mercantilist. Uh, they believe in that old kind of 17th century East India Company type model. That's Belt and Road. That's Costco, the Chinese overseas trip, uh, shipping company. That's what they're doing. 
and they're really trying to entice it. And the problem China does is they can just lowball everybody. They really do. Why are there ZPMC cranes in 80% of US ports is because they're cheap as crap. You can't buy them compared to Irish or Finnish cranes. They just undercut everybody. And they know that. And therefore, that becomes a big issue. Uh, all right, let's go on here. Uh, Sean Huntley uh, just popped up. I have a book I want to send you. It's written in California during the gold rush by a captain in the Royal Navy and long distant family member. Uh, Sean and everybody else, if you'd like to contact me, very easy, Mercogliano-Sal at gmail.com. Uh, that's my last name, M-E-R-C-O-G-L-I-A-N-O-S-A-L at gmail.com. And, and I appreciate it, Sean. Thank you so much. Uh, go on here. And again, I'm trying to find some questions I haven't had. Uh, Vic, any thoughts on great late shipping for 2023? The shipping season just opened. Yes, it did. And uh, really interesting shipping season it has been so far. I mean, obviously, snow and ice up on the lakes. Uh, I get the NOAA ice report. Always interesting to look at where ice is forming up on the Great Lakes during the year. Uh, I think Great Lakes shipping is one of those areas that we, I, I, I don't talk about enough. I know that and I apologize. I've been trying to do better with that. I had some great stories about uh, the Barker, the new Great Lakes uh, ocean carrier that was built up on the Great Lakes, uh, talking about more about Great Lakes traffic. It is the fourth ocean, the fourth coast of the United States. And it's really interesting. I think if you look at Canada versus US policy, it's really interesting. Canada doesn't have a Jones Act. So what they did is they opened up the uh, their coast to foreign built, uh, foreign flag, foreign registered ships. Uh, the U.S. doesn't. U.S., you got to be Jones Act. you got to be U.S. built, U.S. flag, U.S. owned to operate. And it's the tale of two fleets, a uh, much newer fleet in Canada versus a much older fleet in the United States. However, that's not always better. And one of the things you see, for example, in Canada is the lack of repair facilities, uh, shipyards to get those ships repaired. Because since Canada is not building on the Great Lakes, you see the closing of shipyards and repair facilities. You actually have Canadian ships going out through the St. Lawrence Seaway to go get repaired or coming to U.S. yards uh, to get repaired. Uh, the U.S. needs to invest more in the Great Lakes. We really do. Uh, I, I, I've talked about this with the military a lot, is the military has a category for ships that are called military useful. We should have a category strategically useful. I think iron ore carriers coming out of Duluth are strategically important for our industry and our economy. They should be considered national mobilization assets. Yeah, you're not going to use a Great Lake ocean carrier in a military role, but actually we did. In World War I, World War II, we did. Uh, we actually cut Great Lake carriers in half, brought them out of the Great Lakes and use them. Uh, we used iron ore carriers, for example, in World War I, World War II to carry over fully equipped railway engines over to France. Uh, we used uh, uh, OSHA, uh, we used uh, bulk carriers, ore carriers to carry aircraft, helicopters, uh, you name it, because they're big, huge, cavernous vessels. My favorite one ever was we took two U.S. Navy colliers at the beginning of World War I and loaded them with 10,000 tons of wheat apiece to head over to France to feed France. So I, I think we need more on the Great Lakes. I'm optimistic about this year on the Great Lakes. I think it's going to be a really interesting year to see. Uh, I think there's a lot of attention about rebuilding vessels on the Great Lakes. I think the Barker is a good example of that. And I'm hoping to see Fincantieri and the Green Bay Yards there maybe get some contracts here this year for that. Uh, going on here, Renaud, can the post-Panama ships nearing 400 meters long pass through the Suez Canal or are they too big? So Suez Canal has Suez Canal Max. There are dimensions there that the Suez Canal has. The problem the Suez, I'm glad we're coming back to the Suez Canal because this is where this all started two years ago. Uh, the problem the Suez Canal has is they're expanding the canal. They're, they're, the area where Ever Given got stuck, they're making it wider and bigger. Great. They haven't yet said whether or not they're going to expand the Suez Canal figures. And as long as they keep making ships bigger for the canal, they'll keep building them. And right now, 400 meters is about the length. The other reason for 400 meters being the length for most ships as the max is dry docks. They, there are not a lot of dry docks that are longer than 400 meters, about 1,300 feet. Uh, so if you don't have dry docks longer than from them, because you, you got to dry dock a ship uh, twice within five years. And so if you don't have dry docks, you can't certify the hull. Which, and if you can't certify the hull, you can't get insurance. So uh, that's going to be a big issue going on here. All right. Uh, coming toward the end here. So I'm going to get a couple of here. 
Uh, I'm gonna jump around here, see if I can find some people here who have not, I have not asked questions to. Let's see. Uh, Renault, I'm going to give you a second question. Can Northeast Asian ships sail through the Bering Strait during the summer to reach the Northeast coast of America or even Western Europe? How much time and cost would this route save? So two routes. You come through the Bering Sea, you either go east or west, either, uh, east or west, but they're named different things. So the one over Canada is the Northwest Passage because that's the view coming from the Atlantic. The Northeast Passage is that north of Russia. And the Russians have been advertising the Northeast Passage for a long time. They, you know, the day ever given went around in the Suez, they announced, hey, Northeast Passage, we can get you around uh, uh, the Suez Canal if you need to. The problem was it was March. So wintertime is the worst time to go through the Northeast Passage. Uh, the Russians would very much love to open up the Northeast Passage to routine transits. The problem is you have to be ice strengthened to go through the Northeast Passage. You still have loose floating ice through there. The other thing is what Russia is trying to do is change the law so that that is declared a coastal water, an inland water of Russia. So they would have oversight over it and could conceivably charge tolls to go through. Ironically, the Canadians on the Northwest Passage also declares that they're territorial waters and restrict passages through there. So uh, I think that's a problem on both sides that we're seeing right now. So one of the things that uh, has been happening here recently is that uh, a lot of debate about this, one of the reasons we see China building icebreakers, for example, is to be able to maximize that. All right, uh, let's go on here a little bit. Uh, QA library, where do rehab, uh, repair, refurbish cruise ships in USA? Can repair yards designed for cruise ships get used for other ships or cruise ships pay such money they do not want to open up to other ships? So. Obviously, USA, you have a unique situation. Most of the cruise liners that operate in and around the United States are foreign flag, the exception being the one Norwegian ship that operates off of Hawaii uh, that is under the Jones Act and the smaller coastal vessels such as American Cruise Lines. Uh, American Cruise Lines will go into smaller ports uh, and repair facilities in the U.S. That's not a problem. If you look at ships on the east Gulf Coast of the United States, they tend to go to the Bahamas or over to Spain or Europe somewhere for their dry docking. So they're using Bahamian uh, they're using Europe. Uh, Jamaica is trying to open up a repair facility now for them. Uh, they will try to go outside the United States because it's cheaper. It just it's cheaper. They don't have to go in a U.S. port to do it. And so therefore they're going to go ahead and head over there. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that again, the U S has not been able to break into that repair. They will do emergency repairs. They'll do some light repairs when the ships are in U S ports, but most of the time the cruise ships will have an additional crew on board riding crews to do the repairs themselves. You'll see them on board. Lots of times you don't even notice them. They're in the coveralls. Uh, those will be the riding crews on board. Cruise ships, you have to understand are designed to be at sea 365 days of the year. They have redundancy in engines. They have redundancy in power plants. Uh, it's very rare when you see a cruise ship actually go down. Uh, they will usually within a five year period schedule, you know, a, a major dry docking, obviously, which will be about a month or so. Uh, and then, you know, uh, about a, a couple of weeks every other year or so. I did uh, when I was on a last on a cruise, they gave us the itinerary book for the, their cruise line. And for fun, this is me. I'm such a geek. I had fun is I sat there and I plotted out all the availabilities when the ships weren't sailing uh, and figured it out that, you know, OK, this ship's going in its dry dock. This ship is going for a repair facility. And then you had some ships that were just consistently for a year, 365 days. They were on like seven day cruises and they would operate the whole time. But that didn't mean they weren't doing repairs. I, I found a chief engineer on one of the cruise ships I was on went to my alma mater, SUNY Maritime. So he gave me a tour of the engine room, something you don't always get to do. And he sat there. He said, "I got three main e engines for the propulsion, and I've got three en I've got three diesels for uh, the house, for doing hotel, uh, for doing you know the lights and everything on the ship." He goes, "I don't need that." He goes, "He goes, I only need two main engines to steam." He goes, uh, and so I got the third as a backup. He goes, and if I need to, I can cross connect the smaller diesels in because of the, they're all turbo electrics uh, in. Uh, so I can, I can hook them in or as a pot. I can't remember which one his ship was, but he can hook it in. So at one time or another, one of his engines is complete. One of those six are completely offline all the time. They're taking it apart, stripping it. One's on stand, one's, you know, one's on standby. And then the other four are running everything. 
And usually if he's just slow steam, he doesn't even need the, the two of the big engines doing it. So again, they build a lot of redundancy uh, into this. All right. Let's go on here a little bit more here. I'm trying to find some last minute questions here. I appreciate everybody in, man. We're running about 200 people in here. So I appreciate everybody coming in. Uh, maybe you can just report back on petroleum week. Huh? Much appreciated, sir. Yeah. There are obviously a lot going on in petroleum to talk about. Uh, Indy, I, 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 I busted on Indy for his bad jokes before. So I, I, I guarantee you here. In closing today's show, one last bad joke. I find the history of shipbuilding just riveting. All right, Indy, I, I let you in on that one. Too good. Uh, let's go over to John here for a second. Uh, John, Sal, how will autonomy, both for ships and in port, be rolling out with intercoastal waters over the next decade? John, that's where you're going to see it. I, I, I would predict that's where you're going to see it much more being done. So if you look at what's going on in Norway, in Japan, in Korea, they're doing this on a much smaller scale. So you got coastal vessels that, so for example, in Norway, they're doing a vessel in and out of fjords, uh, container ship, full autonomy, uh, hybrid power, I think it's electric, uh, going in. I think that's where you're going to see it. Autonomy on bigger ships, you'll see it more and more automation on big ships, you know, uh, crewless engine rooms. Uh, you know, you'll still have crew in the control rooms, but less crew down within the engine rooms. I am going to predict right now that in our lifetime, we're never going to see ocean going unmanned vessels i i just I, I cargo vessels uh yeah you'll get an unmanned vessel crossing the atlantic and the pacific you'll see that uh but in terms of cargo vessels no no one's going to ensure that no one's going to put billions of dollars with a cargo on a, on a vessel and take the crew off and hope it shows up on the other side not going to happen but you will see it uh on uh on uh uh, smaller vessels. And I think that's the really interesting thing. Battery tugs, ferries, uh, that's the, the model you're going to see, but until you can figure out cars and trucks or aircraft, it's going to be hard to do it on ships, but that's the big issue they're looking at. Uh, Lisa, can you comment on the extent of shipping impacts from the Dnieper river and other inland waters in Europe as a result of the Ukraine conflict? Lisa, I would tell you that one of the reasons Russia invades Ukraine is exactly that reason. Because the Don River, which is the inland waterway system for Russia, the Don bridges through canals and tributaries into the into the Volga, the Caspian Sea, one of the things that Russia was absolutely paranoid about was the northern stretch of the Sea of Azov between Crimea and Mariupol in the hands of the Ukrainians. And they were terrified that the Ukrainians would shut down that sea lane and they would shut down shipping coming out of the Don River. It's one of the reasons why in 2014 they grabbed Crimea because of the Kerch Strait. Uh, they were always concerned about that. And so I think one of the reasons, I've had this discussion with a lot of people who watch the Black Sea Grain Initiative, that the reason for the Black Sea Grain Initiative, the reason Russia allows Ukraine to export grains is because that then guarantees that Ukraine will not target their shipping and their commercial shipping that's coming out. Now, the Dnipro River, which is basically the border right now between Ukraine and Russia, is a, a big problem because that river was essential for Ukraine getting out grain. Uh, and that's going to be the big problem in the spring here coming up is the ability of Ukraine to get the grain out because they're not going to be able to use that river, which means their railway systems are going to be taxed. Their trucking is going to be ta taxed to get that grain to the southern Ukrainian ports, Odessa and the other two ports, or to the Danube to get it out. They used uh, the Dnipro to be able to get that uh, barge traffic down, but you can't do it now because it's literally the front line in some areas between Russia and Ukraine. So uh, really great question, Lisa. Thanks for adding it. Asking it, excuse me. All right, do three last questions and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, shiny side up. Just wanted to congratulate you on handling such a lively question. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, I appreciate that. Though we had a question there, but we'll keep going here a little bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, Blair, uh, with the new uh, AUKUS agreement, do you think we will see a U.S. naval base in Australia? Every U.S. Navy sailor wants that. Can I be clear? <laughs> Ask any U.S. Navy sailor. They want a Navy base in Australia. Best liberty ever for a sailor. I've sailed around the world multiple times. I've been in seven seas. I've been on six of the seven continents. The only one I've never been to is Australia. I've actually been to Antarctica. Went to McMurdo Station. Not fun. Uh, but I haven't been to Australia. And I could tell you right now, talking to people in the Navy, they would love that. I do. I think Darwin, Fremantle, Perth, West Coast Australia is where you're going to see it uh, develop somewhere along those ways. 
uh, without a doubt. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, jump over here. Here's one. I not uh, Merle. Uh, do you think the California Harbor Department will wake up to the economic damage they are causing to the ports? Wow. I, I Can I just say, I think that's a, a very uh, spot on question right there. Uh, LA just announced these green shipping deal that they, uh, green shipping corridors. They're talking about going zero emissions by 2040 on certain routes. I, I don't see how you do that. I, I just don't. I'm sorry. Ships are the largest objects ever constructed by human beings. And I, I, I don't know how we get them to zero emissions. I just don't. Uh, it, it's very difficult. There is an offset for everything you do. If I make a campfire, I'm putting emissions into the atmosphere. Uh, you got to go back to age of sail to do this. And unless you want to build 15,000 one TEU sailboats, uh, I don't know how you counter a 15,000 TEU ship. Uh, because even with a lot of the alternative fuel sources there are, there's energy costs associated with it. Liquefied natural gas. To liquefy that natural gas takes a huge amount of energy. To do it, where's that energy coming from? Uh, hydrogen, you name it, battery power, copper. You get copper, you get tons of copper to do this. And so I think all of this uh, creates uh, uh, big problems for it. And I, I think California is is literally shooting themselves in the foot sometimes. I think they are hurting themselves more than anything else. All right. Uh, two questions left. We'll go here. Uh, Grant, any thoughts on the cyber attacks? We've seen shut down Iranian ports. Cyber is the threat to ocean shipping. If you want to talk about piracy in the modern 21st century, I know our image of pirates is, is Somali pirates grabbing Tom Hanks. But in truth, the modern piracy is cyber piracy. Ransomware attacks, the most devastating cyber attack was against Maersk with the Napietia virus in 2017. Shut Maersk down for a week. Cost hundreds of billions of dollars. That's the element that came in. I posted a video on Chinese cranes, and I got a lot of flack from it too, by the way. I had a lot of people saying, you're, you're you know, China fearsome. No, I'm not China fearsome, but what I am worried about is that a lot of our technology we use in, in ports now are linked. They take updates and there are potentials for cyber attack. What happens if the cranes go offline? What if the, the, the safety uh, margins for the crane go offline and now you can damage the cranes? Uh, I think all of that is a really important element to think about. And I think cybersecurity uh, is an element and it's a weapon that we use against it. We know we cyber attacked Iran with their centrifuges. Why wouldn't we attack ports? And that's the type of war you would see. You know, one of the things, if you get into a US China war, which I know a lot of people like to prophesize about, uh, I watched the 60 Minutes episode. I got a great 60 Minutes uh, critique on that 60 Minutes episode, but it's tied up with YouTube right now for a copyright infringement. So I'm trying to get it loose. I'm waiting to hear from them. Uh, but one of the things that they mentioned that 60 minute report is that the way they foresee the initial war with China would be an attack on our satellites uh, and then also cyber attacks, especially against West Coast ports. And that's because they would lock up our cranes so that we would not be able to use them. I think that is a viable issue. All right. Last question. Uh, I'm going to go to Sean, Sean O'Brien. Don't forget about the Sable and Wolverine. Great Lakes paddle steamers converted into training aircraft carriers for World War II. So, uh, you know, I've I've done more naval topics here recently for a variety of reasons. Uh, I try to hit areas of naval topics that relate to ocean shipping. You know, I, I think there's a lot of good sites out there that deal with all things naval, uh, and you can, you're more than welcome to subscribe to them and watch them. I know I do. I, I have some great buddies uh, who do it. I, I have some I comment on. Some don't want to talk to me for some reason, uh, but uh, I. I uh, think that naval issues are really good. And this little element here of naval history, Sean, uh, is a perfect one. So I, I think uh, you uh, tap into a, a great question there. All right. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up at this point because I'm over time here. I apologize. Minute 14 seconds is a little bit, a little bit long for me. But I just want to take a moment. Uh, two years into the channel has been, for me, uh, an absolutely uh, incredible whirlwind of events. Uh, I'm looking up right now where the channel stands. Uh, 76,633 subscribers. Just absolutely crazy. Uh, the day I started this on March 23rd of 2021, uh, I had maybe 200, 300 subscribers. Uh, and the amount of views was ridiculous. 
And uh, within a day or two after Ever Given, I started doing some hits with the BBC, thanks to my buddy John Conrad over at G Captain. He gave my name to the BBC. I did some talks on Ever Given. And then I decided because they were so short, those talks, I would just go ahead and do some videos. I did them with John and a few other people. Uh, and it took off from there. You know, I went from having three views on my channel the day before Ever Given Hit to 3,000 the next day to uh, the past uh, couple of days because of the petrol rolling over uh, about a quarter of a million views on the channel over two days. Uh, it's it's surreal at times. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it's a little bit crazy. But one of the things that I think this channel demonstrates more than anything else is how you can actually make your voice heard. I get contacted by amazing people around in, in influential areas. Uh, in April, I'm heading up to Boston to give a talk to the Customs and Border Protection uh, uh, Department. Uh, I'm giving a talk next week online to the Naval Association of Canada, uh, where the head of the Canadian Navy is going to be in attendance. I gave, I went out to Victoria here last year in October to talk, and I got to meet uh, Admiral Angus Topsy, the head of the Canadian Navy. Absolutely fantastic. I met the uh, second in command of the Australian and, and, and uh, New Zealand Navy. Uh, I met uh, senior admirals from the US and British Navy. Absolutely just crazy events. And I, I, I always attribute that not just to me, but to the fact that people are interested in this topic. And I think one of the best things about YouTube is, and social media can be, is that you can find experts out there, not me, I find the experts and provide them for you. Uh, but you can find people out there and bring them together. John Conrad always talked to me about the idea that he would bring people together into that forum. And that's what allowed him to develop. And uh, I have to say that that's what this has done for me. And I wanted to take the moment uh, two years into the channel and say it. I'm not perfect. I apologize. I try, you know, I, I try to do the best I can. Uh, I'm torn in many different directions. But, you know, when something happens, my priority here for you as subscribers and contributors to the channel is obviously once a week to get that what the ship out to give you that 30 minute block of what's the big if issues in news so that you can have that, uh, to give you a story two times a week about on one particular aspect that's really important that, that hits the news that maybe doesn't get enough coverage out there in the mainstream. So for example, when petrol rolls over the history of that ship, why is the Navy buying it? What's it going to do? I thought it was a really good one. Uh, I got a story here today, just, just looking at that's really kind of resonating on that now that I want to put together for you. Uh, I, I think that that is what has allowed me to keep doing this. I love this. This is, this is one of my favorite things to do. I enjoy this immensely. I love the the subscribers I have. I love the comments I get, uh, even the negative comments. Let me be clear. I, I, I understand that. I'm not perfect. I, I, I chuckle sometimes when I make mistakes and everybody <laughs> highlights my mistakes because I make them a lot. I know that. Uh, I try to fix them as much as I can. My pronunciations aren't the best. Uh, but you know, there's also those moments of just pure fun doing this channel. I'm not going to lie. The video I just did on the container ship coming into Taiwan with the drunk pilot, I was laughing very much throughout that thing. I had to stop the video a few times because it was very humorous. That video from the, the Taiwanese news agency had me uh, as being very funny when I did the reenactment of the error forward, which by the way, I heard from the Chesapeake Bay pilots that uh, officially they weren't happy about it, but unofficially they thought it was very funny. So uh, I, 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 I know my acting isn't the greatest, uh, but uh, I appreciate you all letting me uh, uh, run with it. So uh, with that, I'm going to come to an end here. Uh, I look forward to doing this. Uh, if you want another live stream Q&A, let me know. I'm always interested in uh, feedback, what I can do to make the channel uh, a little bit uh, better for you. Feel free, either in the comments here, uh, email me again, mercoglianosal at gmail.com. You can always get me that way. And to all those of you that contribute, the super thanks, the uh, uh, Patreon, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you don't know what that does to alleviate me from having to take extra jobs teaching uh, and to pay for a lot of these things that are unfortunately are, are, are expensive. Uh, and so you make it easier for a college professor to uh, run a uh, YouTube channel all about shipping. Until next time then, 
I appreciate it. Uh, everybody have a nice, safe voyage. And until our next video, this is Sal signing off.